Um, I'm going to uh, talk about some of the experiences I've had working uh, in a VA clinic with patients who uh, have tinnitus that it also has a traumatic exposure uh, component to it. Uh, and I'll try to be speaking also about civilians, not just the veteran population. Um, I think I have to disclose that I have a job and that the government might not agree with what I'm saying. <clears throat> The, um, the topics that I want to cover are listed here. I'm going to try to weave that clinical data in throughout. I think it works a little better that way. Uh, so the populations that are at risk for uh, tinnitus that's related to some kind of traumatic exposure would be uh, in civilian groups. Uh, motor vehicle accidents probably are the main thing. Falls uh, sometimes as well if they were uh, violently induced. But we don't want to forget about uh, victims of uh, sexual abuse, captivity, the sex trade. It turns out the highest prevalence uh, that we know of for post-traumatic stress disorder in the world is in Thailand. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, with respect to the military populations, of course, combat exposure, combat veterans, blast survivors. Um, and we also want to remember that we've got this, um, <clears throat> got this voluntary uh, military. And a lot of people go into the military uh, sometimes not having many other choices. And sometimes these individuals come from backgrounds where they may have not had the easiest childhoods either. And it turns out that abuse in childhood makes you more prone to develop post-traumatic stress disorder if you're exposed to trauma later in life. So I think that's another important consideration. And then captivity is uh, one that's probably uh, not reported as often as uh, it's occurring, and that's actually a very large factor here as well. Uh, with respect to traumatic brain injury, which very often is involved in these cases, you see some statistics there. Um, with respect to children, falls are uh, much more frequent than you might expect, but we're talking about uh, close to 50,000 fatalities a year and close to a million and a half cases a year. And the, reason this is important is because it makes people more prone to depression uh, and, it, and th that those kinds of psychological uh, um, events can make recovery from the TBI that much more uh, complicated. With respect to blast exposures, of course, we would expect that they would be uh, uh, highly uh, related to the onset of tinnitus, and that's one of the things that I really want to focus on. Um, but we see here from some uh, data from Michael Hoffer that uh, it's very often the case that tinnitus follows the exposure, uh, lasts for a while, and uh, affects uh, a majority of the folks. Let's also keep in mind that whiplash, and we've kind of heard a little bit about this today uh, or, and yesterday as well, where whiplash, some kind of acceleration, deceleration uh, injury can also be associated with tinnitus of a couple different forms. Kreuzer with the uh, Tinnitus Research Initiative did a very nice review of traumatic, uh, of tinnitus associated with trauma. And again, you can see some of, th some of the statistics there. Um, so 15% of this population uh, had mentioned some form of traumatic exposure. The rate that we see in our veterans is a bit higher than that, but I think the point is made that it still is something that's uh, quite prevalent. We also want to recognize that a lot of individuals who suffer a TBI also end up developing post-traumatic stress dis disorder. And as much as I'd like to focus exclusively on PTSD, that's really a different, uh, a different talk. That's a different topic. And if anybody wants to talk about that afterwards, I'd be happy to do so. Kreuzer uh, and, and that group mentions that a sudden onset tinnitus places a greater burden, those are their words, on the, uh, on the patients. And this is something that we've seen in our clinic where patients with sudden onset tinnitus will uh, provide for us higher THI scores than those with a tinnitus that was gradual in its onset. Uh, and here's how, <clears throat> excuse me, here's how, uh, here's how we would define a sudden onset tinnitus. Uh, we also then, I think it would follow logically that patients who do end up with post-traumatic stress disorder are twice as likely to tell us that they had a sudden onset tinnitus than the patients who did not. And a lot of these patients can actually tell you the moment. They'll tell you the day, they'll tell you the time, they'll tell you the moment that it occurred. Uh, it's a, it's a life-changing event for sure. <clears throat> 
with respect to a variety of studies, both uh, from within the military and from other populations, the um, occurrence of a TBI really greatly uh, increases the likelihood that somebody will develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And you can see there's a lot of variability, uh, all the way from 90% down to about 33% in the military population, and you know zero up to 70 in the civilian population. So it's, it's kind of all over the map. But the idea that you should uh, take with you is that the patients that you see who have TBI histories uh, may also, uh, upon a more detailed interview, yield uh, information that would be consistent with a PTSD diagnosis as well. Certainly it argues for polytrauma teams and interprofessional teams for managing uh, and, and helping these patients manage their problems. Now, uh, I want to just very quickly bring up something that we, we actually just heard about, and I think Rich raised a very good point about this, this idea of sensory mislabeling. So we see that as an element of post-traumatic stress disorder. And the way that I think about this is that there is a broken sensory system, a disordered sensory system, that sends a faulty message forward that will then be interpreted more or less correctly. The problem is that the signal the brain is interpreting was incorrect to begin with because it was being processed by a flawed sensory system. So when I think of sensory misinterpretation or mislabeling, uh, I think the person actually is convinced that what they're hearing is an excessively loud sound because that's what their central nervous system is telling them that they're hearing. The problem is with the, uh, the, the um, sort of the movement of that signal through the system and then how the brain is going to respond to this exaggerated version of what just happened in the environment. So when I think sensory uh, mislabeling, I, I think that the person is really getting it wrong when they perceive a sound. And it's very often the case, as Rich was just explaining, that the uh, image that they have of this sound will be that its magnitude was much greater than it really was, if you want to talk about something like loudness hyperacusis, for example. So I think this sensory mislabeling is important because patients very often also know that they are not correctly interpreting their environment. And they know this because they act out incorrectly, inappropriately at times, and they're reminded of that. And so giving them the information that they need to sort of overcome some of these processing problems may be a real important consideration for us. Uh, and indeed, as I'll explain later on, I think that's one of the things that we as audiologists uh, really have a lot to learn from the trauma uh, patients about. So this just kind of summarizes that. I thought it might be easier to just look at the picture. Um, when we now talk about patients who have had TBI, who have had uh, some kind of traumatic exposures, who have been uh, exposed to uh, ongoing stress for a, a you know, long amount of time, there will be changes in the chemistry of their central nervous system, and there are a couple of hormones that are, or neurotransmitters that are, are worth, worth looking at, and those would be adrenaline and cortisol primarily. Uh, cortisol is a, actually a very powerful neurotransmitter, and it produces some really very fundamental changes uh, in the way that our body uh, functions, the way our bodies and our brains function. Um, you know, just take this for example, reducing immune system activity. The idea is, what do I need an immune system for if my life is being threatened right now? What's really important is getting through this. I'll worry about a cold later on, presumably, right? So these are some really uh, fundamental and basic changes in, in individuals. Now, during uh, periods of extended stress or trauma, uh, there will be uh, a lot of adrenaline also available. And it seems that cortisol and adrenaline are uh, intimately uh, associated with the development of certain kinds of memories, specifically these emotional memories that are sometimes called flashbulb memories. Uh, and these would be memories of specific environments, specific events, things to be avoided primarily in the future. So you have a, an existential threat. You remember what the world looked like. You remember what the world smelled like. You remember what the world sounded like when that occurs. And if that ever happens again, you're going to go into survival mode, perhaps unnecessarily. 
Uh, lots of examples of this. You can be at a cookout on Veterans Day, somebody drops a piece of cheese on the grill, that smell of burning fat or whatever it is comes out, and all of a sudden a bunch of people start heading away from the grill because they can't, uh, can't tolerate that, uh, that event. We also know that um, chronic, chronically high levels of cortisol uh, actually influence the integrity of certain neural structures, specifically the hippocampus. Uh, Bremner in, uh, from Boston has shown uh, rather convincingly that hippocampal volume in veterans returning from combat deployments is actually smaller uh, than it had been pre-deployment. So we see that these elevated levels of stress hormones actually physically damage structures in the brain. How is a person now to behave the same as they had been before, consider themselves as having the same character as they'd had before, when their brain is fundamentally altered? So some of the personality changes some of the um, difficulties that these veterans have coming back relating to their families, uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that they are actually a different person in some very important ways. Uh, and if you've ever interviewed any of these patients in the clinic, one thing that maybe you'll hear is something along the lines of, I just wish I could get back home. I just wish I could get back to who I was. And um, Jonathan Shea has a, has a really nice book about this called Odysseus in America. It's the second book of a series that he wrote. The first one is Achilles in Vietnam. So that's the warrior's story. And then there's the returning warrior's story, which is even, in a lot of ways, even more, um, more difficult to accept. Uh, well, with these changes in the hippocampus, we would expect there would be some learning impairments. We would expect some memory problems, and I think what we are really going to be focusing on now is this idea that uh, the way that a person has stored some of these events in memory, uh, and if tinnitus is involved in that memory, that's something that can really influence the patient's ability to manage the tinnitus, and of course it's something that the clinicians are going to have to consider. The reason I bring up memory, uh, or just to kind of reiterate its importance, would be, I think, evident from this uh, questionnaire that civilians would be given to determine whether they have post-traumatic stress disorder. And you can, you can see here that there are these, uh, um, uh, these elements of memory that are kind of woven into whatever it is, is distinguishing that patient from somebody who does not have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and what we're really going to focus in on in a moment is this idea of remembering uh, certain parts of an event that was, uh, that was powerful to you. This is something that's been talked about by a variety of different people for a very long time. Uh, so William James uh, talks about events as, as leaving scars almost, so the memory would be almost like a scar in that way. Uh, Judith Herman, who has done some fantastic uh, writing on trauma and trauma victims, uh, quotes, Freud as indicating that hysterics, and, and hysterics in the 1800s are now post-traumatic stress disorder patients today. So there was no DSM indicating back then that there was post-traumatic stress disorder. That doesn't appear in the DSM until 1986. Uh, but they were, those patients were called hysterics uh, prior to that time for a while. And again, what they're suffering from are these reminiscences, okay? Well, the damage to a person, the uh, impairment of their central nervous system may compel some kind of neuroplasticity, and Aggie Moeller reminds us that uh, although plasticity is always purposeful, it's not always beneficial. Uh, so the questions then we would want to ask would be these. Um, we know there are going to be traumatic events that are going to produce auditory insult. Uh, is the process by which those memories are consolidated and formed, are the, is that process going to um, uh, raise the probability that a person suffers more from tinnitus? And then can tinnitus serve as a trigger or be triggered by environments or uh, memories that remind the person of that event? To uh, take a look a little more closely at how these memories are going to be formed then, it's worth looking at this uh, model from Diamond's lab where they are considering uh, a few different stages immediately following a traumatic event 
in the consolidation of memory. So at first there's a priming, if you will, of the system and it appears that both the hippocampus and the amygdala are displaying a lot of activity. Within minutes, however, the hippocampus activity has, uh, has been inhibited. There are a lot of people who would say that the hippocampus would be contributing to declarative memory or verbally accessible memory, the kinds of memories that you can make a narration uh, about. Uh, as time goes on, though, that uh, part of the brain gets inhibited while the amygdala remains active. The amygdala would be associated with non-declarative memory, emotional memories, memories that are not easily put into words. So with respect to the hippocampus, you might have a narrative saying, I went to the place and I was threatened by this person and this stuff happened, but it's a story. With the amygdala, it would be more like, all I can think, all I can remember is that I was really cold, it was dark, I had this feeling. But it, it's very difficult to put those uh, memories into words. And then ultimately, uh, both of the organs are inhibited, and it's thought that that's when the memories are really becoming consolidated uh, for that individual. The other thing that Bremner and others have shown us is that the um, prefrontal cortex, which in trauma patients or in, in anybody, would be uh, required to uh, e exert some inhibition over very powerful survival-type responses uh, when they're not appropriate, the prefrontal cortex is itself inhibited in these patients and is therefore less capable of putting out the fire when a survival response gets triggered, whether a survival response is merited or not. Um, Diamond also tells us that the more profound the trauma, the more likely it is that the prefrontal cortex activity will be inhibited by a greater amount for a longer amount of time. Jonathan Shea, the guy who wrote those books I just mentioned, describes it this way. Um, under these conditions, the mind undergoes this distinctive, very unusual kind of learning, right? It's, it's learning um, an environment. It's learning a threatening event. And it is going to generalize that because to maximize survival, any environments or situations that resemble the uh, original trigger uh, will need to be responded to similarly. Uh, Lupien has also talked about this and has uh, actually kind of divided things up, uh, she and her group, into physiological stressors and psychological stressors. And I think we've heard already, especially in the talk Rich just gave, about psychological stressors, the anticipation that there's going to be something happening that I need to worry about. So it's not just physical stress, it's also psychological stress, and you want to think of physical stress maybe as immediate and psychological stress as anticipatory. So uh, what we can do is actually kind of put some of this together and see how a person might react to sound uh, both in an appropriate or inappropriate way. So what ought to happen when we hear a sound is that the sound would be processed. It will or will not affect a person's emotional valence depending on what the identification of the sound is. There will be the potential for change, but again, that's going to depend on whether the sound is interpreted as a threat or not. If it's interpreted as something that's not a threat, then the system will not be, in a sense, reinforcing itself. So let's see what happens when a door slams suddenly, unexpectedly. Uh, again, the sound will be processed. If the person understands that it's a door slamming, um, it is not going to uh, change their emotional valence. They, there will not be a change in autonomic activity. They will just kind of jump a little bit and say, okay, that somebody slammed a door. But in the case that the uh, system is not functioning properly, the sound might be identified as some kind of unexpected impulse sound. It might be consistent with past warning signals or past traumatizing sounds. And it will be uh, more likely to uh, modulate then or modify emotional valence. The person will respond to the sound emotionally when in fact there's no need to. And if the prefrontal cortex is impaired, as we suspect it might be, their ability to calm themselves down after that might also uh, be more difficult or challenging. Um, and this kind of goes along with, uh, again, some of the ideas we've heard expressed about um, uh, hyperacusis or about uh, reactive tinnitus. 
We would expect that if a person's system is uh, somehow disordered, they might experience some more persistent effects after they get trigger triggered. So we see that with uh, our patients with psychological problems uh, and post-traumatic stress disorder, where they're much more likely to have reactive tinnitus. Uh, they're even more likely to say that their sound tolerance problems are worse than their tinnitus. And if you ask a bunch of patients with PTSD to rate their sound tolerance problems, uh, they'll e actually rate it almost twice as high as the patient with tinnitus who does not have post-traumatic stress disorder or some other psychological problem. So we see it is uh, a very substantial overlay to a tinnitus case. Uh, again, they're just much more likely to say that sound tolerance is an issue. Um, so we uh, want to we want to recognize that even though a sound may not be threatening, it may be interpreted as a threat. And again, that would be that misinterpretation we were talking about. And this is why I think counseling for us is so important. If you think about those hysteric pa hysterical patients, um, you would recognize that the uh, first folks that were really working with them recognized the value of talking to the patients, establishing a dialogue. They ultimately called it psychoanalysis, or catharsis even. But one of the patients, one of the more famous patients, Anna O, oh, uh, actually called it the talking cure. And I really like thinking of that with respect to tinnitus patients, patients who are really bothered by their tinnitus. We've heard about sound therapy. We've heard about a whole lot of different ways to uh, try to change the tinnitus signal, try to change reactions to the tinnitus. But clearly, patients who were, had probably been through a lot more than most of our patients recognized the value of talking through it and getting for themselves that verbally accessible memory, if you will, getting for themselves that lexicon that they needed to keep themselves straight when they were getting triggered by something else. So these are the, some of the things that I think we can learn from working with and dealing with some of these patients who have uh, psychological comorbidities. And just to kind of take that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy model real quick, let's just take this and flip it on its side. So now the event is over there and the thoughts are over here and the response is over here. What we want to do is we want to change those associations so that we can modify somehow the emotional response. So let's use some uh, real examples here. Uh, a patient might tell us this. A patient might tell us this. We can use tinnitus, tinnitus activities treatment. We can use different kinds of counseling strategies. We can, use, uh, we can use hearing aids. We can discuss sleep hygiene. We can do all kinds of things to try to, again, minimize the impact or minimize the patient's likelihood that they're going to be thinking like that. And again, perhaps change uh, some of the emotional content of that. Uh, I don't really have time to go into this. This is really interesting. I did want to just mention one thing, you know, this, this idea of learned helplessness. If you have two groups of patients or two groups of subjects and uh, you have them all listen to a tone while you're having them do some task and you let half of them have control over the tone and the other half not have control over the tone, the patients that have control over the tone will outperform those who do not. A lot of times they just leave the tone on. It doesn't even really bother them that much, but just knowing that they can control it allows them to outperform the other people even when the tone is on. It's a really unusual finding, and it really reinforces for us how important it is uh, for patients to have the sense that there is some way to control what's going on. And so cognitive behavioral therapy has been reported in a lot of studies now as, as being particularly efficacious. Uh, I have a student working on a, a project where we uh, were putting hearing aids on patients with PTSD just to kind of see how they would respond to those and what it, would, uh, what it would do for them because in the clinic we have a lot of patients who come in with hearing loss and PTSD and about half of them that get the hearing aids love the hearing aids because now nobody sneaks up on them anymore and they can hear everything going on around them. The other half hate the hearing aids because they jump through the ceiling anytime a fly lands on the windowsill. Uh, and so we wanted to look a little more closely at that, and that's what we're doing now. So hopefully we'll have an interesting story to tell there. But like I said, we have about half the patients uh, in, in the clinic with PTSD who find some benefit uh, for their tinnitus, not just for communication. So with respect to what audiologists need to look out for, uh, you really, the main thing here is you want to create a safe environment for your patients. You want the patient to come in, 
if it's a, a trauma victims, they have to feel safe in your clinic. You have to be able to create a, an environment where they will be able to freely and non-judgmentally tell their story. We know these things co-occur, and uh, all these slides will be up, uh, but the main thing, again, is to create that environment so that the patient will have the, the tools, you'll be able to convey the tools uh, to enable that patient to manage more successfully their situation. Thanks very much. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you.